In his 2012 book, The City That Became Safe, Professor Franklin E. Zimmering systematically examines how the city of New York experienced one of the largest crime drops in all American cities between 1990 and 2009. Crime in New York City dropped 80% over a 19-year period. As Zimmering points out in his book, this crime drop was twice as long and more than twice as large as crime drops in other cities. And it is particularly fascinating that this crime drop was achieved without sending more people to prison. In fact, the amount of New York City residents who were sent to prison actually declined significantly between 1990 and 2009. It is noteworthy that this was done at a time when incarceration levels were expanding at a rapid rate all throughout most of the United States. Throughout his book, Professor Zimmering utilizes official data and performs complex multivariate statistical analysis to, ex to explain exactly how America's largest city became safe over a period of only 19 short years. He compares the city of New York to other major U.S. metropolitan areas and even compares New York City to other major municipalities throughout the world. As we will soon see, this makes for some very interesting reading. While all of the major crime indexes in New York City dropped significantly between 1990 and 2009, it should be noted that homicide experienced an extremely significant drop of 73%. For example, in 1990, roughly 31 out of every 100,000 residents living in New York City were victims of a homicide. By way of comparison, in 2009, less than six out of every 100,000 New York City residents were homicide victims. Of course, it should be noted that Professor Zimmering does not include the 2001 September 11 attacks in his analysis, and most statisticians would agree that this is appropriate. Outliers such as this, while very tragic, do tend to distort aggregate findings and do not really provide actual insights into the larger crime trends that are actually occurring. I think it should also be noted that all of the major index crimes significantly declined over a 19-year span in New York City. Crimes such as rape, assault, burglary, larceny, and automobile theft dropped while they went up in some major cities throughout the U.S. And again, as noted earlier, these crime drops in New York City occurred at the same time that fewer and fewer New York City residents were being incarcerated. In other words, the city of New York did not solve its problems of crime merely by selective incapacitation, which tends to be very costly to taxpayers and is considered to be a rather expensive way to alleviate the problem of crime. As Zimmering points out in his book, the crime decline in New York City occurred in all four boroughs of New York, though there were nevertheless variations especially for violent crimes such as homicide. For instance, Queens and Manhattan have consistently had homicide rates that were half or less than or less than half of Brooklyn and the Bronx. Zimmering seems to imply that this may be due, at least in part, to various demographical variables which influence victimization rates. Because we know that members of racial minority groups tend to disproportionately be victims of homicides, variables such as race certainly provide insight into different homicide rates throughout parts of New York City. In Manhattan, which is undoubtedly the most prosperous area of the city, almost half of the residents are white, non-Hispanics. On the other hand, only one of eight residents living in the Bronx are white, non-Hispanics. Therefore, substantial differences in racial dynamics across the four boroughs provide insights into why, for example, the homicide rate in the Bronx is more than double the homicide rate in Manhattan. Nevertheless, in 2009, the Bronx, which was New York City's most violent borough, it had a significantly lower homicide rate than cities such as Phoenix, uh, Chicago, Houston, Philadelphia, and Detroit, among others.
even though the crime of robbery in New York City dropped by roughly 84% between 1990 and 2009, Zimmering still contends that this crime still possesses a threat to safety compared to other American urban standards. In 2007, official data reveals that there were 265 robberies per every 100,000 New York City residents. While Zimmering seems to be somewhat critical of this, it should be noted that robbery is a crime that is very prevalent in large northeastern cities such as New York. Many scholars have pondered as to why prevalent as to why robbery is indeed prevalent in the Northeast and the Midwest. And though Zimmering does not really make this point in his book, the reason may be due in a large part to the cold weather. For example, if it is 20 degrees outside, robbers, like everyone else, will bundle up. They'll be able to wear long jackets and possibly even masks without drawing any attention to themselves. Rather than appearing to be a potential criminal, they'll most likely be viewed as a passerby um, who's trying to keep warm. Dressing up warmly allows one to conceal his or her identity. Therefore, it should not come as a complete surprise that robbery rates tend to be higher in colder cities which are often located in the Northeast or perhaps the Midwest. And it should also not be surprising to learn that robberies in these cities tend to occur during the cold weather season. So while Zimmering seems to imply that the robbery rate in New York is still too high, I think perhaps he's being a little bit too critical here. One of the parts of Zimmering's book that I particularly like is when he compares crime rates between New York City and its two Canadian cousins, Toronto and Montreal. Interestingly, according to 2007 official data, the city of New York had a much lower rate of nonviolent property crimes, such as automobile theft and burglary. Nevertheless, New York City still had a substantially higher murder rate and robbery rate than either Canadian city. Still, I think it is interesting that New York City, America's largest metropolitan area by far, was able to be competitive with Toronto and Montreal, which are without a doubt the two safest major cities within the entire continent of North America. Now if we venture across to the globe, across the globe to Japan, we'll see that cities such as Tokyo enjoy by far the lowest crime rate of anywhere in the world. Uh, so even while the city of New York enjoyed a homicide rate of only six people killed per every 100,000 residents, this rate was nevertheless six times that of Tokyo. Robbery in Tokyo is almost non-existent compared to cities such as New York, London, and Sydney. Many researchers have been fascinated with Japan's low crime rate, myself included, and scholars often ponder what exactly is responsible for this low crime rate. I certainly do have my own theories about this, but rather than going into this now, I'm going to incorporate this into the weekly discussion. I am interested in seeing if you have any ideas as to why cities such as Tokyo uh, and countries such as Japan in general have such a low crime rate when compared to major cities throughout the world, such as New York, London, and Sydney, among other major metropolitan areas. Tokyo, in particular, has been the envy of many police chiefs. Let's see if we can figure out why Tokyo is so successful in having a low crime rate. Regardless of the fact that New York City still has a substantially higher crime rate than the city of Tokyo, crime and violence in New York um, is still quite low, I think, by American standards and by some worldwide standards. Uh, Incidentally, Zimmering points out early in his book that the city of Los Angeles also enjoyed a significant drop in crime between 1990 and 2009. And, in fact, the city of Los Angeles is second only to New York City in its overall crime drop during this time frame. 
Does it surprise you that the two largest cities within the United States are also first and second in crime declines? Many researchers have been surprised to learn this, and it really is an unexpected phenomenon that has never been entirely examined in any meaningful detail. So for the rest of this book, we're going to analyze exactly um, how crime was able to drop by 80% in a major American city, that being New York City. While we could easily study the city of Los Angeles, we're going to spend the majority of our time investigating New York City in particular, since this is the focus of Franklin Zimmering's book. Zimmering alludes to the fact that economic development within Manhattan, particularly in the area surrounding Times Square on 42nd Street, may be due, at least in a small part, to the crime drop in at least one of the four boroughs of the city. As he explains in his book, nearly $2 billion was spent by corporations such as AMC, Disney, and Viacom to transform Times Square from a seedy, undesirable area to a family-oriented paradise. Today, one can walk the area of Times Square and see marquees advertising family-friendly plays and musicals such as War Horse and The Lion King. Today, the peep shows and the massage parlors have pretty much disappeared from Times Square, which means that this has driven out the prostitutes and the pornographers, and more importantly, driven out the customers. As Zimmering insinuates in his book, Consumers of the adult sex industry tend to be thrill seekers who are at an unusually high risk of being both crime victims as well as offenders. In spite of this, only a very small percentage of the crime drop in New York City can actually be attributed to physical or economic transformation. After all, all of the four boroughs in New York City experienced a significant drop between 1990 and 2009. The city that became safe is, in my opinion, one of the most important academic books to be published within the last several years. Obviously, it is appropriate for any course related to policing, but the book could also be just as relevant for a course in corrections. For example, after reading the first few chapters of this book, one cannot help but wonder what would have happened if the rest of America followed New York's lead of shrinking rather than expanding the prison population. We know that the city of New York sends a significantly lower rate of people to prison than other major cities. So this begs the question of what might happen if this model was followed throughout the rest of the United States. Another very important question that I think is worth asking is what would happen if money that is now being spent on prisons was instead diverted and used for policing the streets. Would American cities see a decline in crime similar to what New York City has experienced? This leads to broader questions about punishment. For example, why does the U.S. lead the world in the business of punishment and incarceration? Our country has only 5% of the world's population, yet it houses over 25% of the world's prisoners. Yes, you heard that correctly. This book, I think, is very eye-opening, and as we will see, it may offer hope, possibly even encouraging policymakers to seek far more reasonable, perhaps even humane, alternatives to incarceration. I think that we're really going to enjoy exploring this book in the weeks to come.